So this was an exhibition I curated at Museum Sheffield last year that was the conclusion of a one-year research project funded by the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. The project looked at the museum's uh, very large post-war art collection, so it was about 1,400 objects, where I was tasked with enhancing audience engagement through public-facing events and uh, concluding in an exhibition showcasing um, unknown stories in the collection. So to do this, I use the theme of domesticity, uh, which is a theme I've been researching for quite some time, um, as a vehicle to explore how the collection did or didn't represent perspectives of home in post-war Britain. There was a particular emphasis in my research on looking for marginalized objectivities, so both um, as the subject of artworks and also those individuals making the artworks. And I wanted to specifically address the representation of women and queer experiences of domesticity, which I felt had been largely excluded in historical surveys of this period in art history. The collection research and the exhibition curation was guided very heavily by several engagement activities working with two local community groups uh, in Sheffield, including a group of older adults who had lived through that post-war period, so sort of 30 years following World War II, and also with uh, refugee groups in Sheffield who were more, uh, more recent migrants into the city. I asked both groups about their experiences of different homes and how their understanding of home may or may not have changed over time. So this is done through oral histories um, and taking notes and sort of recording um, their sort of reactions to artworks that I showed them that related to things we were talking about. So taking on board the huge range of issues that materialized um, throughout those activities, I work to let this uh, guide my research and help me select artworks for display. So it was quite an iterative process of working with the groups, going back to the collection, working with the groups, going back to the collection, bringing the collection back to the groups um, and, and sort of um, going back and forth in, in that way. Um, and in the end, the groups produced a um, really amazing interpretation for over half the works that went on display. Um, and this was quite an important point for me as a way to decenter my own um, authority and voice in the display, but also the institution's perspective um, uh, in the interpretation. So the exhibition presented um, a pretty eclectic range of media and styles of over 60 works, ranging from kitchen sink painting, pop art collages, feminist installation art, suburban photography, and uh, religious sculpture. Um, but the interpretation did a lot of the heavy lifting work in questioning the canon of art history. Um, so I really wanted to think about the collection as both a representation um, or as a sort of model of, 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 of many regional um, public collections as well, but also um, the sort of canon of British art history, um, as well as the uh, more um, local uh, history of the, uh, the city's collection as well uh, in Yorkshire. So, for example, um, I wanted to challenge assumptions about um, still life compositions as being second rate feminine subjects. There's an awful lot of still life compositions in regional collections um, by women that just don't get put on display very often. So I tried to address that in some of the questions that I raised and posed in the interpretation. I also foregrounded um, queer domestic stories, which were actually quite numerous in the collection. It's just that those works hadn't ever been talked about in that way, um, or the research hadn't been done so that the artists were um, recognized as working in a queer capacity, where they had been um, elsewhere in other collections. And I also drew attention to the collection's lack of representation of, um, of women's domestic labor, particularly as it was articulated by feminist art. So the she collection at Sheffield didn't have um, very much feminist art at all. So um, because there wasn't a way to address that in a presentation of work in the collection, um, we borrowed work from private collections to, um, to sort of fill that gap. Um, and then through those um, activities, uh, working with the lenders, we were able to actually acquire several works, uh, several feminist artworks into, into Sheffield's collection.
When I research artists, I think a lot about groups actually with regards to the, I suppose what you could describe as a more lateral network um, of people that effectively facilitate creative life. Um, I think there's ways that you can look at power dynamics um, according to perhaps a more vertical axis of power. So who has power over others with regards to money um, and status and institutions. But I'm really interested in social um, and emotional networks, sexual networks, friendship networks, where collaboration, reciprocity um, is really integral in, in the production of um, art and culture as well. So for example, I've recently started a new research project about 20th century female dealers um, that's very much structured around that kind of um, networked model um, this more lateral model of, of groups effectively. So I'm really interested in mapping um, the people that I've become aware of and the dealers and, the, and their sort of networks um, across different places and activities that relate to structures of power and privilege too, but also to, to sex, to friendship um, and, and support networks effectively. So I'm sort of interested in, in trying to kind of explore that model right now. Um, so, for example, within this project, um, I'm really interested that um, a lot of the female dealers in London um, in, the, in the sort of 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s, there was a, a, a large number of Jewish lesbian emigres um, who were very integral in supporting other queer artists, um, not just financially, but emotionally. So giving them um, support as, as immigres, as queer immigres, as Jewish immigres. Um, when they, you know, had left Europe and, and come to settle in London or, or in Britain, they didn't all just settle in London at all. Um, so rather than looking at the way art was exhibited and sold as mechanisms for sort of visibility and power, I'm quite interested in the way um, circumstances and networks of friendships, parties, lovers um, might materialize the way you might map, for example, a family tree. I think this um, helps to move beyond a kind of fetish, fetishization of the kind of um, individualistic, romantic, solo male artist who works alone in a, in a vacuum, but really helps to broaden out understanding the, the conditions for the production of art. So, you know, not just thinking about the dealer who sold the work, but actually the people who supported that individual to express themselves, to live a creative life. Um, so really thinking about how that, that um, the circumstances of the production of art um, in in those ways are, are, are important. Um, yes, I do consider my approach to curating to be feminist insofar as um, I understand um, like or I have my own definition of feminism. Um, for me, I guess it's important that feminist curating isn't just about honing in on gender issues. So because I work with a lot of regional public collections, my approach um, interrogates the structures of power that I understand to create both local and national histories um, of subjects and societies through, through visual culture. So in my current job at the Hepworth Wakefield, I work with a mostly 20th century collection that indirectly revolves or uh, is in orbit around the legacy of a woman, Barbara Hepworth. But this doesn't mean that we're, as an institution, absolved of thinking critically about the diverse representation of subjects. So I think it's important to think um, when you're thinking about what do you mean by, by feminist curating, especially in public collections, that you're always assessing um, what is in a collection and, and why it's there. It's really important to interrogate why it's there, but also addressing what's not there and how um, you might be able to resolve that. So for example, if you need to have a temporary exhibition so you can tell a story that you can't tell with your collection, or if you can make an acquisition that can then um, sort of fill that gap. And I suppose what also makes my approach to curating, to my mind, feminist, is that I try to have a part of my practice planted firmly in a critical mindset of being alert to how structures of power create mechanisms of exclusion 
um, and really how to make those um, mechanisms apparent while at the same time um, trying to captivate and inspire people with compelling stories. And those two things are not always easy bedfellows in, in public museums, but ultimately um, I want to be able to create um, a situation where audiences are, are creative um, in their engagement with the ethical revision of, of our given histories. Well, it depends on the methods and it depends on the institution. Um, I'm lucky to currently work at the Hepworth Wakefield, it's a museum dedicated to the legacy of a female artist, where the curatorial learning and public programs um, very eagerly explore a range of subjectivities and experiences. Although, of course, there's always more you can do. I guess I think that you should never feel too comfortable in thinking about your approach um, as as working just fine um, and perhaps that is sometimes the point of friction um, with feminism within institution I think feminism is constantly adaptive it wants to um, it wants to change it wants to to sort of re revisit ideas all the time but institutions um, sometimes have a tendency to fall back on their sort of tried and tested approaches um, that they know work for their core audiences in the way that they sort of deliver programming um, so it can be a challenge to develop ways to do things differently, to kind of have that level of criticality, to, to revise working methods. But when it's done well, um, it's brilliant. And, and those are models that are really inspirational and, and really inspiring for, um, for other museums to, to follow. So perhaps um, a test of whether an institution is sort of capable of integrating feminist methodologies um, is if they're able to, to, to reassess their own working methods and, and curatorial methods and learning methods um, by questioning their limitations. Are they, are they really challenging that they can develop new audiences? Are they really challenging the current audiences that they have? What, what more can they do? Um, as I'm filming this, the George Floyd protests are, are very much on, ongoing and social media the last two days has been awash with arts institutions stating their solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. But it really remains to be seen whether these spaces um, and institutions can truly reflect on their working practices and, and implement real change. So finally, I think that to be a curator employing feminist methodologies um, is not just about the way that you curate exhibitions in an institution, but it's also about the way you behave as a feminist in the sector. So this involves being aware of your own power and privilege and thinking about the ethical choices you make, um, including who you work with. So that goes for the artists, the volunteers, the placements and the staff that you hire, um, and also how you might create opportunities for a more diverse workforce. The precarious labour upon which much of the arts industry relies is something we all have to grapple with constantly and, and confront. But I think that if you're aware of the way those precarities disproportionately affect certain groups, you can be more mindful of instigating practices that might mitigate that. So for example, making, um, making sure that you're not um, advertising a, an artist's commission or an internship that might make it so that a person with childcare responsibilities um, couldn't, couldn't participate. Um, and I think only then when you start really being aware of the kinds of exclusions that certain museums um, or institutions um, in many ways unconsciously perpetuate, um, only then can you really start to sustainably bring a feminist practice, not just to curating, but within the institution itself as well.